1942, especially the early days of the Pacific War, were a dark time. The Bataan Peninsula, which was where General Douglas MacArthur and his forces were holding up out against the Japanese onslaught, and they were failing. They did not have the supplies they needed. They did not have the manpower that they truly needed. And as a result, President Roosevelt ordered General MacArthur to retreat. Well, just the general, not the forces. The forces would hold out in a fortress on the Bataan Peninsula called the Rock. MacArthur got out with his family by submarine and, of course, established his headquarters at the, uh, in an area in Australia. But he made an iconic statement designed to inspire the Filipinos and others that he was leaving behind. That is, I shall return. Now flash forward about, oh, I guess two and a half years, give or take, to 1944. And in 1944, it is a time in which the United States is making great strides across the Pacific. And the battle for the Philippines is going to be one of the decisive, if not the decisive, battles of the war. The Japanese understood that if they lost the Philippines, they lost the Pacific War. And so they threw everything they had into it. However, the United States Sixth Army, and led by General MacArthur, arrived in force on the island of Leyte. And while he was there, they filmed actually the scene that you see behind me was caged more than one time until they had it just right. He did not arrive under withering enemy fire by no means. But the iconic image that you have, he made the statement to uh, President Manuel Quezon. Uh, he said, the president said, and that's it, everybody's going to see uh, uh, me you know, get wet or see us get wet. He said, well, he said, they're going to find that I can't walk on water, so we're good together. And as they got off, he made the statement as they got to the beach and they set up the radio, and I quote, this is the voice of freedom, General MacArthur speaking. People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippines whole. The hour of your redemption is here. Rally to me. General MacArthur, October the 20th, 1944. They still had a lot of work to do. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, gives his hearers, he gives his disciples primarily, uh, you might say, a preview of the last days. And in doing that, he's also, in essence, giving us a heads up so that we may look up as we lift up our worship and work to him and we can be prepared as we would rally around the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Version. I will be looking at and beginning with verse 13, actually, and moving from there. As he's given them, you might say, the preview, he says, Therefore be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man who went to earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached presented five more talents. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful 
over a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seeds. So I was afraid. I went off. I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he who will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God bless the reading of his word. Today I'm not focusing on the lazy servant as I am the two other servants, those who were faithful, those who were doing what their master wanted. You and I can be ready because in the meantime there is no downtime. We have the Lord's business. We have the Lord's work to attend to. And that business is the souls of men and women. And it is the doing of our duty and our shoeboxes represent a portion of that. Taking God's work and investing it so that He, by His grace, will multiply. This Thanksgiving, let it be a, a preview of what I call His purview. Let us ponder and pursue the insights that are in this text as we think about living in these times. Charles Spurgeon said, remember, if you're not witnesses for God... You will be prisoners at his bar. You must either occupy the witness stand for God or else take the prisoner stand to be tried and found guilty. I believe that this captures the spirit of the text of Matthew chapter 25 as Jesus has explained some deep truth using parables or stories. As we have read through this entire text, I will reference the scriptures from time to time and I will use a different translation so if you're wondering where I'm getting some dollar amounts from, uh, the God's Word translation kind of translates through the talents into some dollar amounts. I would have you note some words, some key words that are, I think, appropriate as we glean from this text. And there's the word entrusted. These three servants, you could call them stewards. We don't use the word stewards as much in this culture or in this day, so custodian would actually be uh, a good reference point. And so three custodians are, have been entrusted with resources. The master has assembled them. He has given them his money and thus his business interest. He has jobs for each of them to do. And he has given them the means to accomplish the task. And the master has provided resources from the greatest with the five talents, which the God's Word translation will use the money value of, say, um, $20,000. I'm just going with what the God's Word translation says. And therefore, he's going to invest that uh, $10,000, not 20, excuse me. And then he gets a return later on that investment, multiplies it, and it becomes $20,000. Then the, the next person is given the uh, I believe the two talents, which he has of the, the translation that I have, it says it was about uh, $4,000, which means when that is doubled, it becomes $8,000. And of course, obviously, the third servant, given the one talent, it's about, I guess, about 1000 perhaps, give or take. Each one is entrusted with resources according to his ability. The master understood their abilities. He also understood their liabilities. He also knew their limitations. And therefore, he provided for each servant accordingly. And I believe that you can infer from this parable that he would have instructed them on what his, at least his general plans were and certainly his expectations. When I worked for the Madison County Nursing Home, when I was over housekeeping, uh, and I had people who worked for me, I told them, here's what I expect you to do. Uh, we're going to be stripping and waxing floors today. Enjoy, okay? Uh, because I run a tight ship and, you know, I'm a taskmaster. But I enjoyed seeing floors that looked so, uh, so shiny that you thought they were wet. I held, had high expectations. But each one I tried to encourage, hey, we got this. We have to do it over. We'll do it over. It's okay. 
The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 15, another uh, similar parable. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So Jesus said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. Similar to the parable where we are. God has business for his servants. He has business for you and me. Hebrews 6.10 reminds us, for God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown for his name as you have ministered to the saints and continue to do so. Theodore Roosevelt, when he was young, he was obsessed with nature, birds, and, and all sorts of animals. He was a self-taught taxidermist. He also became a naturalist, uh, self-taught. He actually drew uh, pictures, identified all these different species of birds. In fact, had he not been president, he could have very easily been uh, a naturalist uh, with the Smithsonian Institution. Many of his uh, specimens that he hunted and caught ended up in uh, the Smithsonian Institution anyway. Then as a young adult, he was a widower before he remarried, and he spent some time in the Dakotas. And while he was there, he appreciated the land and its beauty. And one of the authors, Dr. David Rubel, says that his experiences out west motivated him uh, to preserve 125 million acres of public land in national parks when he became president. He saw that as a resource that the leadership of the country was entrusted uh, to take care of for all the generations. Chunky Baptist, as we think of that word entrusted, as we think about, uh, yes, the, the shoe boxes and the gifts that are contained therein, uh, they are but a drop in the bucket, and they certainly are not the most amazing things that's ever out there, but they represent something that God has entrusted to us to be a part of, and that is loving people in the name of Jesus and proclaiming his good news. And that is an amazing thing. It is uh, something that we are entrusted. A reason for us to give thanks is that you and I have been so entrusted right here at Chunky Baptist. God has and God does resource us as a church family and each of us as individuals. And he provides for us out of this ample, rich supply to be about his work, to be about his business. And what is that? It is the souls of men and women, boys and girls. Friends, that is grace. Are we grateful in accepting what he has provided? And are we grateful in applying what he has provided? I know that as we think about these boxes, uh, it was it was neat to be able to be at Walmart and be trying to buy things that you know, you'd think a boy would like or a girl would like. I saw some action figures that I like, but I couldn't buy any action figures, so there you have it. Um, you know, uh, some other things, like, that would be really cool, but it would not fit in that little bitty box, okay? Uh, so, I mean, you know, but it was, it was a, a fun to do that, but knowing all the while that it's not about the toys or the trinkets or whatnot. It's about the love of Jesus Christ. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is finished. Ain't nothing added or subtracted from it. And it's about the empty tomb that has validated that finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. A second reason for us to give thanks is that God provides the resources for us. And he takes into consideration our ability to perform. He is aware of our abilities. Why? Because he gave them. He is mindful of any disability that we have, whatever disability that may be, and he is not intimidated by them at all. In fact, he can repurpose them. And he is cognizant of our limitations. And he chooses to equip and empower and use us anyway. Because as the theme says, good news and great joy. Are we thankful? Because he never places a burden or a job on us that we find impossible to bear. Oh, it may be hard, and it may not be always fun, 
But it's not impossible to bear because He bears it with us. He never sets us up to fail. The Bible reminds us in Matthew 11.30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Isaiah 42, verse 3, A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. The third reason that we give thanks and we do so in the context of dedicating these shoeboxes this morning is that you and I, we have been entrusted. We have been resourced or supplied. We have been chosen to be His servants. And this parable is three servants. And the other parable is ten servants. But it's okay. It's the same idea. Servants. And we have the privilege to be busy about His business and His work in this world. We don't have to make it up as we go along. We don't have to guess. But what do we do? We know what to do. And starting with our very own community right here and now, we can be busy about the things of Jesus Christ that we have been entrusted with. Dr. Henry Blackaby states, and I quote, God expects to find you obediently doing His work. Will He find us being faithful and obedient using what He has given us for His glory. Who then is that faithful and wise servant? Whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Matthew 24, 45-47. Let us, are we grateful to be so chosen? Are we busy even today at his work? Do we see ourselves as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ who have been entrusted? But there's another word I would have you uh, note from this text, not just the word entrusted, but there's the word invested. There's an investment that is taking place. Well, first of all, we've been invested by the Lord with His resources, but then we take those resources and we don't put them on the shelf and say, my, how fine that looks. And we certainly don't hide them and we don't bury them. But rather we take those resources, those supplies, whatever you want to call it, and we multiply, well we don't, but we invest it for the Lord. Now I'm not saying let's go call E.F. Hutton, because when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. I have no clue about that type of investment, so uh, I would refer you to others who do. But when it comes to investing those spiritual resources, and those, those abilities and gifts and, and, some, and resources that God gives us as a church or as individuals, that's a whole different ball game. The man who received five talents or 10,000, he did not waste time. He did not waste opportunity. He took the money, he invested it, and in due time, it multiplied. It was not his money. It was money that belonged to his master. He was but the custodian. And he had a duty to use it as the master either directed him to, to do it specifically or to do it in accordance to the expectations that the master had set. Sometimes I've told people, I don't care how you get it done as long as you get the job done. Just make sure it's done right. You know, what is it, measure twice, cut once? Well, if you're going to do a job, per perfect practice makes perfect. You do it perfect, meaning if you aim for excellence, uh, you learn it right the first time, you practice it right every time, you will perform it right any time. That is a philosophy that I have held to for nearly 40 years and ain't breaking it now. Uh, yeah, perfection's hard to, to achieve, but that is the goal, is it not? And so therefore we have in this passage where uh, this man who has done that, he has gone and invested what his master expected. The 10,000 became 20,000. The 4,000 became 8,000. Investment multiplies. This investing, this act of investing in the, in the text, it is a test. A test of what? It is a test of ability. It is a test of capability, of faithfulness of each servant who has been involved. They did their duty. At least two of them did and they did it joyfully. I don't see them coming back and saying, man, let me tell you, that was the hardest assignment you've ever given me. I had a boss sometimes who would expect things of me, and I'm like, really? <laughs> How are we going to die? I mean, I, I get that. But I mean, these people, they go, Master, listen, you gave me five talents. You gave me, you gave me $10,000. I invested it, and I have $20,000. Wow. It is a joy. 
The Bible says, the first appeared, and I just shared that with you from Luke 19. And the master says to both of these two, these two servants, the one with the 10,000 who became 20,000, the one with the 4,000 who became 8,000, in essence, well done, good and faithful servant. As we think about this, the test revealed who could be trusted, who could perform under the expectation and the responsibility placed upon them. As we apply that this morning, Chucky Baptist, Christ knows all about our capabilities. He also knows our capacity. And He wants us to rise to the occasion by His grace. Are we willing, like the two faithful servants in the Scripture, then to invest what has been entrusted to us? Investing ourselves fully and freely in others for the Lord. This morning is an example of your investing some time, some money, some effort, some interest, and hopefully a whole lot of prayer. And as that is sent out, this is taken to the drop-off place, and then that goes to a distribution center. And from there, it's sent to the various areas where Samaritan's Purse will be uh, distributing that for, for the children and, and for their families. Uh, that is a part of that multiplying that goes on. So yes, this morning, uh, yes, this is but a small example of investing in others for eternity. But why does it have to be limited to uh, a Christmas time shoebox? Church, we're to be investing in the lives of people around us even as we speak and sit here or stand here. Invest ourselves faithfully in others for the Lord. See, it's one thing you can work yourself to the bone and, and, and work yourself uh, down uh, for, for the benefit of others and it never glorify God. But if your love for Jesus is what motivates you uh, to be ministering to others and, and to reaching others, then that's a whole different scenario. Are we grateful and thankful that the Lord would consider us trustworthy for His worship? Yes, but for His work as well. Investing was also a testimony. The two faithful servants did what they did. And the way that they did it and the why that they did it spoke volumes about their love and their loyalty to the Master. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's that simple. If we truly say, oh, I love Jesus. Well, then where is the fruit? And then the fruit will be, where is the obedience that is in our lives? And that's a challenge for all of us, young or old. It doesn't matter. When I worked for a Madison County nursing home and hospital, we got a new boss. And he had been briefed, or she actually had been briefed about me as a worker. I always tried to work hard, had a good work ethic. But you know what? I had to prove myself. I had to prove I was worth my keep. I had to prove that uh, I, sh I had a right to be there doing the job. And apparently, I did too good a job because they promoted me to infectious and hazardous waste. I'm like, okay, that's not really what I had in mind. Uh, but anyway, um, there you have it. Well, so too, uh, I'll, I had to live up to that reputation and be teachable at the same time. And the same is for us. To, to each day is a new opportunity to invest what God has given them. Investing is a triumph. The two faithful servants, they succeeded. They had joy in their accomplishment. And they rejoiced with their master. And they, they rejoiced in their master. Dr. A.T. Robertson says that joy is the Greek word kara. And it refers to the feast on the master's return. And that's, when he came home, it wasn't a case of, you, you come here and talk to you. It wasn't that at all. It wasn't that like I might do sometimes. You know, I'm just standing there like, What's going on? Okay. That's not what he did. He threw a party. And then he said, I want y'all to report back. What was, what was going on? And, and they did. And it was a joyful time for all but one. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. You want greater responsibility? You want to see fruit in the basket? You want to see God uh, do a work in this church and we give him the wow for that? then let us invest what he has given to us as a trust. And let us put our hand to the plow and not let go. John Bunyan, who was a pastor and Christian author who wrote the, the book Pilgrim's Progress, talked about a character. And I am reading Pilgrim's Progress, by the way. And uh, there's Talkative. That's the name of one of the characters. The other guy is Christian and the other guy is faithful. They meet up and say, here's what 
you might be said. Speaking of the man talkative, Christian said of him, he talks of prayer, of repentance, of faith, and of the new birth, but he knows but only to talk of them. I have been in his family and his house, and his house is as empty of religion as the white of an egg is of savor or flavor. In this illustration, these two servants, uh, they're not empty shells. They're certainly not shams. They proved to be faithful without any shame. They did the thing. By His grace, you and I make the effort. These boxes represent at least a portion of that. By His grace, we expend the energy. By His grace, we do the enterprise. And we will be recognized for our effort, not just on a Sunday morning, but one day when we stand before Jesus. Even something as minor as the shoe boxes. If we have done it to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be remembered. So let us talk and walk at the same time when it comes to investing that the Lord has entrusted to us. Then there's the word assessed. All the three servants were held accountable. Each one had a moment where they explained what they did, probably how they did it and why, and the word rewarded. There's a recognition and a reward, but there's also a reckoning and a retribution. Here comes the unfaithful servant. I don't want to spend time on him other than to say that what had been entrusted to this third servant had become encrusted because he had buried that. Buried talent is never buried treasure. It's a waste. It's a waste of opportunity. It's a waste of resources. To leave things undeveloped and undone is a waste. Buried talents are worthless. There's no value there. It's dormant. God wants us to use it. So being unprepared for Christ to come is foolish, says Dr. Blackman. To be as the fearful and faithful or faithless servant is woeful. Because the Lord does have a high expectation. Because we know this, that should motivate us to say, Lord, give me the opportunity. Help me to invest everything I am for everything that you are. And to hear the words, well done. Settle it today with the Lord. Allow Him to transform you into the good and faithful servant if you haven't been. And if you are that good and faithful servant, ask Him to continue to transform you into that blessed servant. Faith invests what God trusts. But we come the most important moment. As our worship leaders come, there may be someone here today who needs to nail it down for the very first time. Uh, you can't go where you don't know. I invite you to come and, and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. Let Him become uh, that, that, that master who will entrust you so that you may invest what has been entrusted to you. You come and ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. As we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, other decisions may need to be made. This is a moment that God has entrusted us with. Let us invest it for His glory and our good as we would make whatever decision God would desire for us to make. You come, let us, as we sing our hymn of invitation, you come this morning. Amen.